All right, um, welcome to CS 4510. Uh, first, I have to apologize for talking about the camera angle. Um, so, you know, computers, uh, terrible, invent this thing should have never been invented. Uh, we should have stopped at the Turing machine, because I don't know what this, I've, it works 34 lectures in a row, and then suddenly it just doesn't want to zoom in. This invention was a mistake, so uh, it's too far. We, it, heretical in whatever. Um, so you're going to, if you're watching this at home, you'll have to watch, you'll have to zoom in your actual video because I cannot for the life of me figure out how to get the camera to move. Rebooting things, plugging in things, it's all, it's too complicated. Um, it doesn't really matter. You can hopefully still see the board. I'm just going to have to write a little bit bigger. Uh, today we're going to talk about two things. This is probably one of my favorite lectures. Uh, so the second half more than the first. The first half is on hierarchy, hierarchy theorems. We're going to talk about hierarchy theorems, and we're going to talk about the first, the very first theorems in complexity theory in the first half, which is what Hartmanis and Stearns, uh, they proved these theorems, and by proving these theorems, they founded the field of computational complexity, for which they won a Turing Award and have been uh, immortalized. Uh, I think Hartmanis recently passed away last year, sometime. Uh, very famous guy. Every complexity theorist was his student, and so on. Um, uh, in the second half, we're going to talk about relativization. And relativization is basically, we, can, we don't know how to solve P versus NP, but we know how not to solve it. We know why the question is very hard. And we can prove that the question has no easy solution, even if we don't know how hard the solution actually is. Um, so that's kind of interesting. That's probably one of my favorite ideas in complexity theory. There are like five great ideas in this course, I think. Uh, I think every idea is an important one, but the five most important, in my opinion, are going to be non-determinism, uh, syntactic structures, the Church-Turing thesis, uh, undecidability or unprovability in logic, uh, independent, uh, incompleteness results. And then uh, this one, which is relativization, which is a sort of a proof barrier to uh, what the proof of P versus NP can and can't look like. Um, hierarchy theorems first is, this is really a lecture. Uh, the theorems are relatively obvious, but have an interesting proof strategy. Um, but it, it's important to know that the techniques we're going to use to prove these theorems are the ones that which we won't be able to use to prove previous NP. So that's really more demonstrable. Uh, recall that we did diagonalization, right? We, we did a lot with diagonalization. The whole unit in computability theory was just repeated applications of diagonalizations to different kinds of structures. We did, uh, so first, George Cantor used diagonalization in the 1870s. He used it to prove the existence of uncountable sets. The power set of a set of, a of the naturals is itself uncountable. Then Gödel, then Russell used it to show a set cannot contain itself. Then Gödel used it to show that there exists a statement which could be true but unprovable. And then uh, Turing used it to show that there was uncomputable functions. There was functions which are not, which are definable but not computable. And in all these situations, diagonalization has been used as a technique as a wedge. You have two classes and you can sort of separate them apart. Um, so, for example, Gödel, everything that is provable is obviously true. But Gödel was able to show that there's a slight, just a narrow enough crack for you to throw, throw a wedge in between what is true and what is provable, and that these are not identical. Certainly, everything that is provable is true, but he was able to construct a sentence using diagonalization, which was true, but not provable. Um, similarly, Turing was able to show that there existed a language, as we've called it, halt, which was recognizable, but not decidable. Um, and so on. Diagonalization is a very important technique, and it does have, uh, it basically all of computability is dependent upon diagonalization. And in fact, a lot of the early theorems in complexity theory are dependent upon diagonalization. Um, so first, to demonstrate this, I'm going to first reprove the halting problem using a very different notation. So, uh, and by the way, just before I forget, the, although George Cantor, we credit him with invention of the diagonalization technique, which you have some sort of negated self-reference, uh, there's a book by Kleene, and he actually uh, remarks that it's actually due to uh, Louisville from like the 1840s. Very, it's not a very new technique, even though it seems certainly like a 20th century invention. Um, he says that Louisville uses the something like a primitive diagonalization technique to show that the existence of a, of a real number which is not algebraic. An algebraic number is one which is the root of a polynomial of integer coefficients. And he shows that there exists a number which could not be. Uh, using this kind of idea. And that's like 1840s. So let me reprove the halting problem using a more functional notation as a demonstration of, of uh, what is this technique and what are its limitations. So let, uh, I'm going to remember to write bigger, let phi 1 
phi 2, a b, and enumeration of the recursive functions. Now, I didn't even say what the recursive functions are, but just think of them like uh, Turing machines. Each one corresponds to a Turing machine. Well, we're not going to use a machine definition just for this problem. We're going to use a functional one. Um, compared to computable functions, recursive functions correspond to machines which are allowed to loop. So in some sense, they're allowed to be partial. Uh, computable functions correspond to only the total uh, versions of these functions. But um, the uh, recursive functions are just all of these, uh, of these functions, which are, which are also allowed to loop. Um, uh, let h of y, x, y, uh, be the function that, this, that it returns a 1 or a 0 if uh, the x function on input y halts or loops. So in some sense, h of x, y is a decider for halt. It says the x the machine halts on input y. Here we don't have to talk about the code of a machine when we can talk about the index and some ordering it has. Um, just, to slightly, just to emphasize the functional, that there is a functional proof of this. By functional, of course, I mean like we can write everything as functions instead of machines. A machine is an object. There's intermediary states between those things. A function doesn't have any intermediary states. It's quite literally, what can you do to a function? You can give it input. You can read the output. And then you can change the function. That's all you can do. So it's, it's, that's going to be important later. Um, we want to prove that there is no recursive function, uh, total recursive function h. Uh, we want to prove that h is not a total recursive function. There is no, there is no, uh, in, in some sense, h is not computable, or the language that h would uh, uh, decide is not decidable. So assume to the contrary uh, that it is. Assume to the contrary. That H is total and computable. You give it an input, it'll always give you an output. There is a procedure to uh, compute this. Then we can define the function D uh, like this. We can say D of X is going to do one of two things. It's going to do, it's going to return one if H of X, X is equal to zero, and it's going to loop if uh, h of x, x equals 1. Um, here, if looping is a machine construct construction, and this is a function. So I really should say here it's undefined. By an undefined function, I mean like, you know, the inputs correspond to outputs, but then maybe there's a one input that doesn't have any corresponding output, right? So this would be a partial function because there's something in the input which is not mapped. Um, that, in a, if you consider this a machine that really means that the machine loops on that specific input, right? So we'll, we can just call it like this, that if h of x, x equals 1, then the machine is going to loop. So certainly we define this function d. By the way, d, of course, is going to be for diagonal. Um, so since h is total and computable, uh, d is a recursive function. d has to be a recursive function. So what that means is it exists somewhere in an enumeration of the recursive functions there phi 1, phi 2, and so on. So there exists i uh, such that phi of i, uh, we could say this way, such that for all x, uh, d of x is equal to phi of i of x. Basically, uh, d is phi of i. They agree on all inputs. That means they're the same function. So uh, d is phi of i for some i. So like before when we did the machine version of the, of the halting problem, uh, we ran the machine on its own code. Here, we're going to pass in its own index. So what is, is D on its own code, I. And again, I is not its own code, but rather the index in the ordering of it. So D is at index I. What happens if you call D on I? Um, so consider D on its own index I. Well, it can either halt or it can either loop, right? So let's say D of I, let's suppose D of I uh, is equal to 1, right? Because d of i is going to either be 1 or it's going to loop. It can only return one of those two values. But if, so d of i, if d on i is equal to 1, we know then that h of i i is equal to 0. And if h of i comma i equals 0, 
we know that phi on i, i loops. But d is phi of i. So that's true if and only if d on input i uh, loops. So we've shown that if d on its own code, d on i is equal to 1 if and only if d of i loops. Can't have that. So maybe it, maybe it doesn't equal 1. Maybe it loops. So d of i loops. If d of i loops, that could only be the case that h of i on i is equal to 1. And if h of i i equals 1, we know that that's, it must be the case that phi of i i halts. And if phi of i i halts, well, phi of i is just d, because d is phi of i. So that's true if and only if uh, d on i halts. And a machine cannot loop and halt simultaneously. Of course, we've reached a contradiction. This is nothing different. This is just simply the same halting problem we've done, uh, but without using a Turing machine notation. We've used a more functional notation. And this might have been the way it, it could have been originally done, because, of course, there's all these Turing complete models of computation. We could have done probably a worse but similar proof of the halting problem for unrestricted grammars or the two-stack PDA or whatever. So if there was some sort of, we haven't defined it, but there is a functional equivalent of a functional uh, language, which is equivalent to Turing machines, which is Turing complete, uh, you could perform a halting problem like this in a purely functional way. And the reason I want to emphasize this diagonalization here is that when you have a function, you can only deal with its input and its outputs. You're limited by the notation. Um, that's going to be more important later. But this is a classic example of diagonalization for uh, the halting problem. Any questions on this before we get to the time hierarchy theorems? Space hierarchy theorems. So uh, we were really successful proving uh, most of or all of computability theory, like not concerned with resource, just concerned with power of these problems of uh, using using. Uh, you could use a functional limitation to reprove every theorem of computability theory. Um, but it, doesn't, it makes kind of a lousy model for complexity theory, because we're concerned with the number of steps that uh, a computation takes intrinsically. And a function doesn't take any steps. It's just in, it doesn't make any sense. A Turing machine, though, takes steps. A Turing machine has, is an, it defines computation as an iterative process to a goal. Um, so quite clearly it makes sense to use Turing machines for that. Um, as a warm-up for these hierarchy theorems, basically what the hierarchy theorems say is it has an incredibly intuitively obvious statement. It's like more time or space is better. More time, space, uh, more better. Given more time or given more space, you can uh, decide more languages, certainly. Um, Well, let's just prove, let me just prove you an example. Now, this proof I'm going to give you is bad, and it has many bugs, but it illustrates the main point uh, quite clearly. We're going to prove that time of n squared is a strict subset of time of n cubed. So uh, the open problems in complexity theory, p versus np, p versus p space, are really involved with trade-offs of different resources. How much p versus p space is like is everything in, which requires polynomial space, can it also be done in polynomial time? We don't think so, but it's about varying resource. If the resource is the same, we're really good at measuring the resource, it turns out. We're really good at saying that, yes, actually, you can decide more languages in cubic time than you can in quadratic time. More time gives you more ability to decide more languages. This is basically what this says. Certainly, everything in n squared is also decidable in n cubed. I'm just doing a little padding. Like, you make every n squared algorithm just wait a little bit, right? But it's also true that this, this inclusion is uh, strict, because these are not equal. Um, 
this doesn't say anything about specific languages or specific problems. Like we can say in general, and this is the point of the proof is going to be non-constructive. We're going to put something in here which won't be in here by diagonalization. Diagonalization, of course, is a separation technique. We're going to be able to separate these using diagonalization. It doesn't say anything about specific problems, like the barriers needed to them, right? You could solve p versus np by simply showing that no polynomial time algorithm solves sat. That would solve the, that would resolve the question because sat not being in p is sufficient to show that p does not equal np. Um, so we won't be, this doesn't say anything about our ability to show lower bounds on specific problems. But it, in general, we can say that more time, more better. That's enough. Uh, and here's the high level idea is we're just going to create, a, a, by diagonalization, we're going to create a machine which runs in cubic time. And its only job is to disagree with every machine which runs in quadratic time. That's its only job. So let, and again, this, bug, this proof is going to have at least four bugs. But we're going to go back and fix them. But it, I just want to illustrate the point, because the, fixing the bugs is actually quite technical. And this is more important than knowing how to fix those bugs. Let m1, m2, dot, 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 be an enumeration of TMs which halt in n squared uh, time. So on inputs of length n, they always take no more than quadratic time to make to reach a decision. Uh, we give a decider d. We give a we give a decider d. Um, a d is for diagonal here, whose only job is to disagree with every single machine. And it's just going to make sure it's different than m. Uh, on at least one word. D on input uh, wi, and wi is the ith word lexicographically. We need to order them some way, so let's just suppose we already know how to order them. Otherwise, we can just, given the word, we can compute the ordering, right? So we're going to say n takes on the size of w. We're going to compute wi, uh, the size of wi. And then we're going to simulate uh, mi on wi for uh, quadra quadratically many steps. If mi accepts wi, and recall wi is the input to d here. If mi accepts wi, we want to disagree with mi. So we're going to reject. If mi rejects, and recall it's a decider, so it's going to accept or reject. It's never going to loop. Uh, wi, we're going to accept. So D uh, decides some language, right? Uh, clearly, well, so first off, we need to show it's in time cubed and not in time squared. Okay? This is kind of troublesome. What is, the, what is the, the only step that really takes the most time for D is going to be this step, this simulation. Everything else is kind of trivial. Um, what is the time it takes for to simulate M for N squared steps? Did you say that one step takes one unit of time, kind of? That would be the most logical, reasonable thing. But it's not true, actually. We don't think it's true. Um, for now, so when you have a real computer and you have real programs, what happens when you simulate something is you just change all the registers and you put a stack frame and then you point to the, the code entrance and then you do something. And then when that returns, you go back to your stack frame. So in some sense, that's like very different model than one Turing machine simulating another. Suppose there's a one tape deterministic Turing machine. It contains on its tape the encoding of a different Turing machine. So it has to simulate that Turing machine's tape, and it has to keep looking back through its transition table and stuff. So it's a very different way of simulation than we think of like a call, like a, like a, like a, like a, like a library call, a system call, or something like that that works for normal computers. Um, we're, we'll fix this later, and we'll, we'll, we'll pin this down more accurately. But for now, let's just suppose that one step of the computation of simulation takes at worst cubic time. Excuse me, at worst linear time. Maybe you have to scan the whole, whole input to go to the transition table, go to the end of the tape, go to the transition table, go to the end of the tape. Maybe that's what happens. It turns out it won't be, but suppose that's true. Then M, then D runs in cubic time. So we, conclude, we can conclude immediately that L of D 
is in time uh, n cubed, right? It takes cubic time. Suppose, suppose this step takes, uh, for every n squared, for every step it takes linear time, and there's n squared steps, so n times n squared is going to be n cubed, right? Let's suppose that takes n cubed time. Unreasonable, but for now, let's just suppose that. Um, how do we know this doesn't work in uh, quadratic time? So suppose it does. Suppose some other machine decides the same language it does, and that LD is in... Suppose that LD is in is actually in time uh, n squared. So then that would mean that there exists an I such that LD that such that this is all suck. Such that um, uh, L is L of D is decided by some uh, MI. Right? But we know that, like, a wi is in L of D, uh, if and only if wi is not in L of M of i. Right? So we know that the LD differs from every i on at least one letter. So it's not actually in, uh, there is no such i. So we know that there is no other machine which uses less time to decide it. So this is not in time n squared. All right. This is sufficient for us to prove uh, that there is a separation. Certainly everything in squared at time n squared is in time n cubed. But we've given one language in time n cubed, which is not in time n squared. And that's sufficient for us to prove the theorem that time of n squared is a strict subset of time n cubed. So there are some immediate improvements you can make this proof, but certainly it's, this is sufficient. Again, I mentioned there are f at least four bugs. We're going to have to go through and slowly patch them. Uh, one of them, let's just mention it now, um, if we did a more careful analysis of this linear quadratic thing, we could get a tighter, what's called a gap. What's the minimum amount of asymptotic time you need in order to decide more languages, right? Like, okay, fine, cubic is more. What about, what if we put a 2.1 here? Would that work? Maybe the gap is smaller. By gap, I mean that's quadratic, that's cubic. Maybe we can advance this little closer and close what that asymptotic gap is. We can actually, maybe we can compute what that gap is. And certainly the gap between uh, how much more asymptotic time gives you uh, more power uh, depends upon this cost of simulation. So that's maybe one way we can fix it. Another thing we can fix is if you notice, this really has nothing to do with squared or cubed. It's for anything k and anything k plus 1. So we could really do this, too. And we can separate 3 from 4 from 5. So we could have done a similar proof for k, uh, for all k. Time of n to the k is a strict subset of time to n to the k plus 1. Right. So and then there we already have a hierarchy of, uh, within p of everything. Um, it's also, we're not, so, not sure how small we could go. For like, so as we consider general functions, what is the asymptotic difference between like log, 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 of n time and log log time. Those are kind of too small for us to appear if there's any asymptotic time. Because within log 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 of n time, can you even calculate n here to know to run your counter? It's not, it's not, we're not sure, right? So like, uh, can you calculate log 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 of n time in less than, log, in less than n time? Don't think so. So there are some, as we, so as we, here to generalize and strengthen this proof, there are going to be some challenges uh, like this that we have to face. And of course, the issues. First issue, I'll just mention it right now. Um, this is not possible. You cannot say let m1, m2 be an enumeration of the machines which, which halt in n squared time. Why? So what exactly does... Um, so you're saying you can't order them or... You cannot say, give me a list of machines which halt in n squared time in this order. Because they're uncountably infinite, is it that? Yeah, they're undecidable. Okay, yeah. Right? By Rice's theorem, 
It's an undecidable, it's a non-trivial semantic property to know if a machine halts within n squared steps. So you can't, you can't just say, I'm going to print out the list of machines this way and then use them in my computation. This is not decidable. Because it's, because it's an undecidable uh, property, it's not an enumerable. So you can't list them like this. There is a way to fix that without having to decide the machine. Um, among some other problems, of course, of this, of, of, uh, this simulation step as well. So now we're going to, uh, so this is, this is the rough idea of diagonalization, though. We need to go in and fix all the bugs and get this as perfect and as, as nice as we can. Um, so this is a, a sort of a weak form of the time hierarchy theorem. We're going to uh, do the space hierarchy theorem as a warm up because the time hierarchy theorem has like one or two more small complications. Space, of course, has a similar idea. Like, given more asymptotically more space, you can probably asymptotically decide more languages, right? So, but how much asymptotically more do you need? Um, the space hierarchy theorem in plain language, space hierarchy theorem, uh, states what? That the space of... The space of little o of f of n... Um, is a strict subset of space of big O of f of n. Right? So this, first off, there's some conditions we have we'll have to say about f, but this is a great gap because little o asymptotically is like the biggest thing that's still asymptotically smaller than the big O, right? So even... And any asymptotically more amount, like constantly many more, probably wouldn't work, but any asymptotically more space allows you to decide more languages. This is a very tight gap, and it's very nice. Uh, we won't have such a nice gap for the time hierarchy theorem. But there's some conditions we have to have on f. First off, f uh, has to be at least log of n. Okay. Um, so like log, log, log versus log, log. Uh, problematic. Actually, I think log, log space can only decide a regular language, I think. Uh, there's a there's a classic proof of that. Um, so it, F, it, by using at least log space, that it allows us to keep counters of size n, right? To, to write down n takes log n bits. So maybe this is where it comes from. And in fact, given some more complicated procedures, I think this can be improved. Um, second is that F is called F is what is called space constructible. Basically, every nice function is space constructible, but there are some not nice functions, which are not what are called space constructible. So basically, uh, computing f of n takes no more than uh, f of n space. So basically, there are some functions which are really, really, really hard to compute and maybe need more space to compute what the function is, and you can't use the function then as a counter without, using, without exceeding your space bound. So like if we have, the point is like if we have two functions like f of n is less than or equal to g of n, we want to show for like which f and g asymptotically more of g can we decide more languages, that's the point. And, but we need to be able to count how much space we have to disregard these to be different than all these and be in one of these. However, if the difference between f and g is asymptotically so small and it's incredibly difficult to compute, then computing the space difference between f and g would be more than using the space. So that makes the problem hard. So we want to say that f is space constructible. All the space constructible functions of, are nice. They're like log n, n, n squared, n log n. These are all space constructible because you can imagine a calculator program to compute n log n doesn't take more than n log n space, right? The bad ones... Like, I can't think of any right now, but if I had to, like, 1 to the square root of halt to the log of, to the log log, to the log, I don't know, something. You can come up with some crazy, maybe you take the nth Fibonacci number and you multiply by the nth prime number. And then, so, you know, there's crazy things you can come up with that don't make any, you would never see them in real life. But you can certainly create such functions, which, actually, that would be a good, good exercise. Try and come up with a function which takes more than f of n space to define. Uh, that f of n takes more than f of n space to compute. It's not easy to do so. Uh, right. So th this is what we require f to be what's called space constructible. And certainly little o, big O, very, very nice gap. 
So first off, we need a way to enumerate the machines. We can't enumerate the machines like we said because it's undecidable by Rice's theorem. But we need a way to access the Turing machines. So what we can do is actually uh, checking if a, if a string is valid syntax is totally decidable. You just run it through the syntax checker, right? So what you do is just take the input, pretend it's a machine. If it is a machine, great. You can just, now you have access to the code of some machine. You can run it on that. So you can do uh, something like this. D on input uh, W, you're going to cast, uh, like, like W is going to be equal to some code of M. Right? If it's the code of M, great. Then you can run M. You now have M. You can run M on, its, on itself. If it's not the code of M, it doesn't matter. You can just keep going. So you can ignore it. Um, The second problem is, uh, is the asymptotics here. Big O is constants, and we, don't, we need to deal with these constants. For small n, there may not be enough, uh, it may not be big enough for the size of W. The machine may be so small at the size of n that it, there hasn't been enough time for it to, the, it to kick in, uh, so to speak. The asymptotics, right? So like, you can imagine large constants. What is it like? Like, uh, let's say you have, a, you have a small constant n squared and a large constant linear time, right? There might be some small n such that the quadratic seems slower than the, uh, the quadratic, well, the quadratic is slower. This, the quadratic seems faster than the linear time algorithm for some, some, some constants. So what you want to do is actually give the machine infinitely many more opportunities to disagree with itself uh, on its own input. So what you're going to do is actually cast uh, the, the word not to be the machine, but to be zero star, one zero star. So what that means is you're going to give it, anytime it's of the form machine and padded, now n is bigger because n is the length of the string. There's large enough n. Eventually, uh, it's going to be able to, the simulation should complete it and it will um, be able to disagree. Our simulation will be able to complete. The final issue is like, because we don't, we, before we were able to say, okay, I erased it, but we were, we were able to say like the machine loops. Oh, we, we were able to assume that the machine halts in n squared steps. Here, this is just a code. It could be anything. We have no idea. Um, it could loop. But there's a way to fix that. Basically, we proved, uh, you may recall that we proved um, uh, if uh, M has space bound uh, S of N, so if it uses no more than S of N cells, we have a time bound on it. Uh, then it has time bound uh, 2 to the O of S of N. Right, you can only go so much time without using more uh, cells if you want to loop. So what we do is we quite simply just add a counter for this. And if it ever exceeds this counter, we know that you have looped. And we can then just e exit the simulation. Um, so the, with these fixes, that's, it turns out that's just sufficient for us to fix um, uh, all the issues we had with the previous theorem. And we can get uh, a diagonalization uh, type argument here. So D is going to be our diagonal. We want to show that this uses space F of N, O of F of N. And it's going to disagree uh, with little o of F of N. It's going to disagree with every little o of F of N space bounded machine. Um, that's going to be sufficient for us to show that it's not decidable in space little o of f of n, and then just a simple analysis is going to tell us it's decidable in o, o of f of n space. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to, first, we're going to compute n is going to take on the size of w, and we're going to compute uh, f of n within f of n space. Uh, we can compute f of n within f of n space because we assumed that f of n was, was space constructible. This step fails, though, if it's not space constructible. That's why it's important. Again, we want the whole machine to take f of n space. So it's, this is use f no more than f of n space. So that, that, that step certainly is important. Um, mark off uh, f of n tape. Uh, if we ever use more than f of n tape, we're going to reject.
uh, if uh, w does not equal something that looks like a machine, one zero star, right? And you can, of course, check this with an f of n space. Given a random string, you can check if it looks like the code of a program, plus one, and then followed by a bunch of zeros. You can check that. Uh, and this definitely takes less than f of n space to do so. But also, most of the time, like 99% of the inputs are not going to look like this, obviously, which is a random input. But we don't care. We only care about the few inputs that it does. Um, so if w is not of this form, we can just ignore it. Uh, I'll say for some m. For some m. We can just reject. Right? Because cool, we're going to get every code of the machine this way. Uh, if we get a code, if we get some machine which isn't O of f of n, let's, we only want to disagree with the machines which are little o of f of n space, which have this little o of f of n space bound. If we somehow get a machine which is like doesn't, which uses more space than that, we don't care about disagreeing with those machines. We only care about disagreeing with the machines we want to disagree with. So that's why we can just reject if we ever use more tape. That's what that, that step is for. Um, so we're going to simulate. Uh, M on W. And recall that W is actually equal to its own code. One zero star. Right. So we run M basically on its padded code. If the counter uh, ever exceeds uh, 2 to the F of N, we can reject... Finally, all these baggage pieces out, the, out of the way, we can, we can now just disagree with the simulation. Uh, so if m accepts w, we can reject. If m rejects w, accept. So this machine certainly decides some language, right? L of D, well, how much tape does L of D use? Ta uh, space, tape. Uh, well, every step uses no more than o F of N, right? We compute F of N within F of N space by space constructability. Uh, everything else is either like less, way less than F of N or F of N. Marking off F of N tape, F of N takes F of N tape, right? Everything else uses F of N tape at most. Uh, so certainly that we know that the language that this thing decides, this diagonal machine decides, is going to be, uh, it's going to be in space uh, O of F of N. So how do we know it can't be decided in any smaller amount of space, right? So suppose it can. Suppose uh, there exists M uh, such that uh, the language of M happens to decide the same language of D. And uh, M uses little o of f of n space. So somehow, let's suppose there's a machine which can use less space to decide the same language. Um, if that was true, though, um, consider D on input the code of this M, 1, 0 to the N, for a large enough N. So... If there is some large, there's going to be some large enough n for this. Uh, if there is such a large enough n, when you consider d on the code of this machine, which supposedly could decide it's smaller in using less space, the simulation will complete and d will differ from uh, m on this one input. So uh, then d disagrees with. Uh, M on the code of M, one, zero to the N, on input uh, 
So D disagrees with M on the code of M, 1, 0 to the N. Uh, so M does not decide uh, the language of D. And since M is any machine which uses space O of F of N, we can conclude then uh, that uh, L of D is not in uh, space a little o of f of n. Certainly the containment is obvious, but now we have shown that the containment is strict. We can then conclude because L of D is in space o of f of n and L of D is not in space of little o of f of n, we can conclude the space hierarchy theorem. Space of little o of f of n is a strict subset of space of big O of f of n. Any questions on this proof? You see what I mean now, maybe about all the small little issues that had to be that had to arise because uh, the first argument was quite uh, quite easy, but then there's all these little kind of gotchas. You got to make sure that the thing works. Um, right. Uh, again, I'll emphasize what I said at the beginning here is that this this theorem is. Uh, one which really just relies on simulation and treating machines as a black box. It doesn't deal with any intrinsic properties of the computation. It just quite literally goes, it runs a machine and then does something different. So it really only deals with computation in an input and output style format. It doesn't actually uh, get too nitty gritty. But that's okay because this is sufficient to show, you know, a, a kind of a beautiful theorem. And this is... Um, Basically, as best you could do with terms of gaps. Like, you need the log n here in order to basically keep a counter. And space constructability, I'm not even sure how to do it without that. That seems uh, like the most basic assumption possible. But it turns out that just even asymptotically, the smallest amount more space gives you uh, more power to decide languages. A final remark is that this is, of course, non-constructive of a proof. There is no actual problem we've shown that requires O of f of n space, which can't be done unless. There do exist problems which are intractable. There do exist problems that, are, that cannot be done in certain space bounds. Like, we unconditionally can show that. This doesn't show that, though. This shows just sort of non-constructively more space is more power. All right, unfortunately, the time hierarchy theorem, which is probably more interesting because no one really cares about space, uh, the time hierarchy theorem has uh, like much worse gaps because uh, while you may simulate, while you may use and mark off certain amounts of tape and measure yourself in this way, uh, you really can't do that for time because marking off, because to do anything requires using up some of your time as a resource and you can't ever get that back. So it's like, it's a much harder resource to uh, measure and approximate. Some of these machines we, we've talked about, we really only cared about their space bound and not their time bound uh, because maybe they use polynomial time, maybe they use polynomial, uh, excuse me, exponential time or whatever, as long as they didn't exceed this tape that they were required to use. Uh, unfortunately, every step of computation requires one unit of time. So this time hierarchy theorem is much worse. Actually, before I finish that, I want to mention two more quick things about uh, the space hierarchy theorem. We proved a very tight gap, but among those, we can have less type. We can actually weaken the proof to separate classes of the same resource. We can actually weaken that proof to prove that L, log space, is a strict subset of P space. So we can separate those two, and we can actually separate that from XP space. So we're able to separate complexity classes that have um, different amounts of space. And actually, by space constructability, if epsilon 1 is greater than epsilon 2, which are any real numbers, so these are even very small, very fine-grained differences, we can actually separate by space constructability. It's a very hard argument to do, but we can actually separate the classes. N to the epsilon 1 is a strict subset of uh, N to the epsilon 2 for any two real numbers, you know. So even the smallest asymptotic amount of, of, of space gives you this, this, uh, this gap. 
So the time hierarchy theorem is unfortunately has a larger gap. So time of little o of f of n over log n, excuse me, log f of n, is a strict subset of time of f of n, o of f of n. So with the space hierarchy theorem, our gaps were really just dependent upon these constants, which allowed us to get really nice asymptotics. Here we have, unfortunately, a log term here. And of course, this is going to come at the cost of the simulation. That's where that's going to pop out of from. The, condition, the conditions on f are going to be f uh, is not log n, but we actually need n log n for this proof. It can be improved with a much more difficult argument, but we need at least n log n time. Okay? Like log log time versus log 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 time out of the question. We're just going to consider n log n and above. Well, that's fine because there's infinitely more things that are above n log n than there are below n log n, right? Uh, and second is f is time constructible. So f of n can be computed within f of n time. So what this means is like f of n can be computed within f of n uh, time. It's easier to come up with functions which are not time constructible than the ones that it's easier to come up with functions which are not space constructible. So like you can come up with a function that requires maybe solving sat or something that's really small, you know. Um, but again, most functions are going to be time constructible. But of course, there are some complicated ones which aren't. Log log cube squared log whatever. You can do something very complicated in arithmetic such that the function is smaller than the time it would take to compute it. Uh, so again, we care about the nice functions, n, n squared, log n, log n, uh, 2 to the n, and so on. Um, so we are just going to, we can just proceed. Uh, applying all the same arguments that we had to do for the space hierarchy theorem. So what are those going to be? I'm just going to write it. I think I'll have to write it here. It uses a vertical space. So again, we're going to proceed by diagonalization. Uh, D on input uh, W. Uh, N is going to take on the size of W. If W does not equal some code of machine, one zero star uh, for some machine M, we're going to reject because we don't care if it doesn't look like the code of machine. We only need to disagree with the machines, not just whatever uh, uh, the garbage inputs we have. Um, compute uh, f of n over log f of n and store, uh, and store it as a counter. So I'll just write counter. Now, because f of n is time constructible, f of n over log f of n also happens to be time constructible because you do one log and you do one division. So this, is, this takes uh, in f of n time. I'll put O of f of n time, right? So computing f of n over log of f of n takes O of f of n time. Um, simulate m on w. And of course, w is going to be equal to the code of m, 1, 0 star, for some number of fixed number of zeros. Um, and then here. Uh, during the simulation, we need to keep it. We need to keep a time counter. We need to make sure that we only disagree. We only care about disagreeing with the machines that run in this time. If a machine uses more time than this, we don't care. So we're just going to exit out of that case. We're going to only make sure we disagree with the right machines that we want to. So if uh, counter uh, hits zero, we're just going to reject. If uh, M accepts W. Reject. If M uh, rejects W, accept. Uh, 
right? Same, basically same idea. Now, here comes the hard part. Uh, let's perform the analysis. I want to prove everything in here. This machine runs an O of F of N time, right? So every step uh, takes some number of time. Let's just suppose that all the other steps combined take O of F of N time, except this simulation. Okay? The simulation takes some number of steps. The rest of it, we can just say is O of F of N time. So if we can argue the simulation takes O of F of N time, we're good. Now, here's the, here's the thing. Um, like D simulates, D simulates M. M. If M takes some T steps, uh, D takes uh, T log T steps to simulate it. I also want to remark that this is uh, machine dependent. Okay, uh, we talked about you know. The difference between a one-tape machine and a two-tape machine actually matters within P, even though all of P is the same for any machine. Efficient computation is the same for which, which kind of model Turing machine you take. But when we're talking about within P, of course, it doesn't matter. Um, so, and this is true for the one-tape deterministic Turing machine simulating another one-tape deterministic Turing machine. Uh, you get different hierarchies for different uh, things. And for different simulations, you can maybe get tighter ones. What I read was this is the only way we, this is the tightest we know, okay? And this proof itself is kind of ugly. How do you give an, give me a T log T algorithm of a one tape deterministic Turing machine to simulate another deterministic Turing machine? It's of course gonna matter how the machine is encoded when you give it, put it on its tape and so on. Um, but it can't ever be constant, we think. It's unfortunate, but it has to be at least a little different. Um, so it does take T log T steps to simulate it. However, we don't run the counter for t steps. We run it for f of n over log f of n steps. So how long does it take to simulate m for f of n over log f of n steps? If the simulation takes f of n log f of n, but we only run the counter to f of n over log f of n, the simulation only takes f of n steps. So we have a, that's where, the, so the simulation of course only takes o of f of n. So the whole thing takes O of F of N. So that's sufficient for us to argue uh, then that D, L of D is in time O of F of N. And maybe we could have put, instead of putting a devising log of F of N term here, we could have put a multiplicative log of F of N term here. We would say like N is a strict subset of N log N or something like that, right? But this is the same thing, right? Um, now we need to argue that uh, there is no other machine which can decide uh, D in less time, in this asymptotically less time. Suppose uh, M decides L of D in uh, little o of F of N over log F of N time. So suppose there does exist a machine which can do it faster. Um, consider uh, D on input. Uh, the code of M of this faster machine, one zero to the N, uh, little n, four large enough N. The simulation now has enough time to complete and the simulation uh, for large enough N We'll, uh, we'll disagree uh, with M on W. Then uh, D disagrees with uh, the code, with not the code of M, but M on input W. So uh, M. does not decide L of D. Since M is any uh, little o of F of N log F of N machine, F of N over log F of N machine, we see, uh, we can conclude that L of D is not, in fact, in time, a little o of F of N over log F of N. 
notation is insane here, right? Um, and that turns out is sufficient for us to prove that uh, we have a gap here. The time of little o of f of n over log f of n is a strict subset of time of big O of f of n. Now, um, this isn't the only applications of diagonalization to complexity theory. We also mentioned previously, like Leibniz theorem uh, was able to, you can uh, use late diagonalization in Leibniz theorem to prove uh, a kind of a separation, right? If P does not equal NP, you simultaneously diagonalize away from P. Uh, so, you're, so every polynomial time algorithm is wrong for this language. And you also diagonalize away from the NP complete languages. So every polynomial time reduction is wrong. So the Leibniz theorem, that original proof is a diagonalization proof. But it is quite compli complicated because you're like double diagonalizing away from these two things and you can only be in the middle here, right? Diagonalization, very important, uh, very important technique, very important theorem. Um, and it's used to take any two classes and try and throw a wedge between them. And it was incredibly successful for proving these hierarchy theorems. Um, there are other hierarchy theorems, of course. There's the non-deterministic hierarchy theorem. There's, and it, it's less of a popular technique now than it was in the 60s when Hart, Bonas, and Stearns introduced it. And we'll talk about why next time. Well, we know quite rigorously and quite intuitively what diagonalization is. You have sort of a negated self-reference. You run a machine on code. Um, can we separate P from NP using diagonalization? Certainly P is a subset of NP, but can we separate P from NP using diagonalization? Uh, next time we'll prove, like next time in 10, 15 minutes, we'll prove no. Actually, there is no proof of diagonalization of P versus NP. And that's a more important result, I think, than knowing how to diagonalize over these classes of languages. All right? Uh, as a final remark, by the time hierarchy theorem, I just want to mention, for this reason, we do know that P, although we know P is a subset of NP, Excuse me, we don't know that P is a, a strict subset of NP. We know that P is a subset of NP, which is a subset of XP time. Um, we do know that P is, by the time hierarchy theorem, you could weaken this proof to just distinguish the polynomial time computation from exponential time computation. So we know that this is one of these has to be strict. Either NP does not equal XP, or P does not equal NP. So we, with regard to the same resource, we're very good about showing separations between classes. And unfortunately, we could not, we don't know how to get this gap any smaller like we do for the space hierarchy theorem. Um, but if we could, you know, uh, we would get be uh, a better theorem. All right? Any questions? <laughs>